go on until 1.45, uh, after which I think uh, there's a tea break, but we can run into that if people would like to, to carry on further. Uh, first, just to check, can everybody hear me? Uh, yeah, good, good. Uh, universal sign language, thank you. Um, uh, what we'll do now is we're going to have this session on uh, online teaching and resources and guidance uh, for the uninitiated, largely. Uh, so we thought uh, Meet the Experts format would suit this very well. So we have uh, Dr. Magdalene Newman, who is a senior lecturer in classics at University Trinity Wales St. David, um, where she works on Latin poetry and particularly recently uh, in Latin literary and great engagement with textiles and material culture. And we have Dr. Ursula Rothi from uh, the Open University who's a senior lecturer in classical studies, otherwise known as Dr. Toga, uh, and has published widely on dress in the Roman Empire, um, particularly around interpreting cultural interactions uh, in the Roman world, in the provinces. So, uh, we're just a reminder, we're recording this session with the permission of Magdalena and Ursula, uh, so that we can make it available to WCC members afterwards. This means that the, anything we write into the chat box at the side will also be recorded and that includes any private messages you write to people, so just be, be conscious of that. Also, as we said this morning, just a matter of courtesy, please don't take screenshots uh, for, for purposes of other people's privacy in their own homes. Uh, I think that's it. What we'll do is I'm going to move straight to the speakers and then afterwards we'll have a discussion We'll remain with everybody on mute, just given the size of uh, this meeting. It's simpler for people to type their questions into the chat bar and I'll relay them uh, in, in the discussion section. So we're going to have one uh, detailed talk by Magdalena and a shorter talk by Ursula, um, given the completely different contexts in which they uh, produce online teaching. I completely forgot which one of you was going to speak first. Um, do we have any preference? <laughs> <laughs> it was me on the program. I don't mind either way. Okay. Okay. So maybe Magdalena, if you want to uh, kick things off, I'm just going yeah. to mute myself temporarily so I don't uh, cough or something. Yeah, I will as well. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me in the first place uh, to uh, give some uh, reassurance and. Uh, personal experiences on uh, online teaching. Now, can I just check that you can see my screen? Excellent. If we try and make it into a slideshow, it will be even better. Uh, so uh, the first thing to, to remember when we talk about taking teaching online and especially in an emergency situation, but also generally is that teaching online is every bit as personal uh, and every bit uh, as much a matter of personal style as when we teach on campus. So if in the last few weeks you have found something that works for you and for your students, then keep doing it, uh, regardless of whether anyone else does it that way or, uh, you know, this is not, uh, and I'm sure Ursula will uh, in with that as well later on, this is not meant to be prescriptive. It's just meant to give you a few ideas and perhaps a little bit of reassurance uh, in uh, stressing that no, just as in the classroom, not everything immediately works the way, the way you intended it to. So I've been doing distance learning for about uh, 10, 12 years. Uh, and um, we do it uh, as most things in Lampeter on a bit of a shoestring budget. And it's not our primary um, uh, it's not a primary mode of teaching really. So uh, I hope that can ease us into it uh, and be an, be an inroad for, for people that are tackling this for the first time. I think what's really, really key and others that have discussed uh, taking teaching online recently, notably on the CUCD blog, for example, has stressed that really reflecting on what you normally do when you teach in a classroom is key to doing this well. So think about what you do in your regular classroom and why you do it. 
what do you want to achieve by a lecture with follow-up questions, by having a seminar, by doing various types of exercises, whether they're hands-on or text-based, uh, and also think about what the classroom uh, environment gives us for free in terms of socializing, uh, flagging up options of pastoral care and peer, peer support. You know, think about uh, those conversations that happen before we start the lecture in the classroom, just as we go in and say hi and you know, look at what our students are doing as, as they're setting up uh, and observe all of those things and only then try to think about how to create online equivalents of those things. And importantly, only then think about what online tools you want to use. Uh, it's easy uh, in this situation to sort of go, oh no, I need to use all this tech. There's Zoom, there's Skype, there's, there's this, there's the other app, there's Panopto, there's Canva. Um, don't let that distract you too much from thinking about what you actually want to achieve. Pick and choose out of those options based on what you're actually trying to do. Uh, and on that note, um, think about whether you actually need to be live all the time. Uh, usually a combination of mainly uh, asynchronous delivery with a small component of live online activities actually works better. So is it easier to provide uh, large amounts of materials in lecture slides or PDF booklets, pre-recorded material, links to set readings that you briefly contextualize uh, rather than doing an online two-hour Zoom lecture just because that's what what's on your normal schedule um, and supplement that with online but not live at a set time discussion forums submissions of formative exercises peer-to-peer -peer work and uh, support and I think this is especially important not to be seduced by tech now that we have a huge amount of students who have very unexpectedly moved online where there might very well be uh, as indeed we have them as well. Uh, issues with access to equipment. Are they using a laptop? Are they using a tablet? Are they using a phone? Are they sharing a laptop with three other people? Uh, and so on. Is there secure internet access uh, when they are based off campus as halls closed? Uh, is there a quiet environment? And of course, now we're also looking at a situation where students have a, a very different uh, capacity to focus on their studies and in that sense not doing very long live sessions uh, or very long uh, recorded um, uh, recorded sessions is uh, is useful hours have commented how much they appreciate the opportunity to use the pause button uh, so it might be easier to communicate in bite-sized chunks already and uh, bearing in mind uh, the numerous other commitments that crop up in the current circumstances as well. One thing uh, that uh, can help make uh, our lives as students a bit easier is to funnel a lot of the admin for a module uh, through uh, your online platform uh, and the forum function there, whether you're using Blackboard, whether you're using Moodle, whether your institution has something else. Uh, on my modules, I have had a strict policy of answering general questions via uh, my Moodle forum rather than by return email. Of course, uh, still keeping the email channel open for personal questions, but tackling uh, general questions about deadlines, readings, where do I find this article, where do I find this dictionary and so on uh, via the VLE uh, forum instead. Uh, I give that information explicitly in the module syllabus at the start of the uh, start of the module uh, with the motivation that I want all students to have access to the same information at the same time. But it also does have the benefit of keeping my email uh, inbox slightly under control. It also uh, prompt students to really engage with the forum. You all know what it's like, you know, you don't post on an empty forum uh, even if you really need the help that the forum is there to provide uh, but if you put 
uh, if you populate it and begin to populate it with those simple questions, when is our essay really due, then it becomes much easier to use it for more discursive communications as well. And what I've seen particularly with my um, true online uh, learners is that often enough, they will jump in and answer those basic questions uh, for each other more swiftly uh, than I can jump in as well, given uh, that we have students across a number of different time zones and so on. And that begins to uh, build uh, channels for peer-to-peer -peer support in the, way, in the same way that you would have in the classroom, where someone just turns around and says, yes, it's on the 27th, and so on. Um, when it comes to using VLE forums for class discussion, yeah, to uh, replace what would have been uh, a tutorial or a seminar session, uh, the most important thing there is to get the forum going. And as students, we need to help make that happen. Yeah? You need to be active on the forum yourself. It's not enough to say, yes, chuck your, chuck your discussion contributions on the forum. You need to be there responding, asking follow-ups, cross-reference between different students. That uh, really is, is make or break for having uh, an active discussion. Occasionally, also, we have uh, emailed out reminders to students to, but we haven't heard from you on the forum, can you please put your thoughts up? At the same time, uh, and especially in this circumstance, it is important to be sensitive, uh, particularly to uh, any student support needs that your group might have. We have on occasion uh, facilitated pre-moderated or anonymous forum posts uh, where that has been motivated by people with uh, anxiety issues, for example, or uh, anxieties around dyslexia and so on. And what we've seen there is that it just it's just the first couple of posts where that is necessary. You can help build that confidence there. The other way that we have uh, used to generate uh, forum uh, use and make it active, uh, and indeed I've experienced this as a distance learner myself, uh, is uh, of course to build forum use into the assessment. Uh, now if the situation develops so that we uh, might uh, still be delivering online in the autumn, that might be something to bear in mind uh, to uh, drive this forward you might work on a format of one post and two responses to make up uh, the, the target for an assessment. I think it's also really important to remember that online groups will be as different as classroom groups. Yeah. One forum might work really well, another might be completely empty, depending on uh, the type of learners that you have. I've had years where my Greek group has been really engaged and posting and talking to each other, and my Latin group has just been zip, nothing, uh, apart from the obligatory introduce yourself post. And that's been not a reflection of the fact, uh, not due to them not wanting to engage with each other, but due to the fact that, yes, my Latinists that year happened to be more self reliant, more self driven, self motivated, and so on, whereas my Hellenists. Uh, were a bit more um, interested in the classroom experience. So if you don't get it to work immediately, don't uh, consign it to, uh, to the trash. Yeah, it might work better with a different group. With uh, pre-recorded materials, now much like plenary lectures, uh, as uh, we've seen hour long pod and vidcasts might not be the best method to convey large amounts of new material. And I think especially in this situation, uh, it takes time getting comfortable uh, with recording lectures in an office or a studio setting. And even more so when you're like I am right now, propped up in a makeshift home office. Yeah, and that's okay. I've had colleagues uh, recently asking for advice to, to do that. I'm finding it really tough to talk to the screen without all the prompts that we're used to getting from the audience. And that's another reason to keep those uh, pre-recorded materials in bite-sized chunks. 
it is easier when you are recording for a specific cohort that you already know. Uh, then you can draw on all your knowledge of their specific interests. And that means that as you teach a module online towards the end of the course, it's usually easier. Having said that, I think short pre-recorded introductions still have a really important role to fill. First and foremost, to show and share your enthusiasm for your subject. Why should they care about the accusative with infinitive? Uh, or why should they care about demographics of Roman Egypt? Um, that is far more what you need to convey than uh, the specifics, the stuff that they can get and should get through reading as well. And in many ways, the way we have debated uh, the uh, lecture as a format uh, recently goes very much along those lines as well. That might be a useful way to, you know, we're going to read this article. This is why it's important. Five minutes on why that is really crucial reading uh, might be a better option than giving a summary of it. If you do live webinars, like we are doing now, please do bear in mind that exchanges like, can you hear me? I can't see you yet, is entirely normal. Yeah, and that happens to experienced tutors and groups as well. Use it as an icebreaker. Think of it as those five minutes where you swear at the, um, where you swear at the uh, PowerPoint projector for not turning on properly and have to climb up on the desk to give it a smack uh, and so on. Uh, it happens, you'll get over it. If you're cool with it, then so will the students be. At the same time, the students do need reassurance getting used to uh, a new mode of discussion, whether they are undergrads just uh, moved online or distance learners taking it up for the first time. Uh, so it's worth setting aside a little bit of time uh, in your seminar just to get your feet under the table. To get a real discussion, small groups do work best, even as they do on campus. In practical terms online, it's also easier on everyone's bandwidth and easier to avoid talking over each other. Uh, before we learn all the buttons for raising your hand and um, hitting the mute buttons and so on. What I've also found helpful is uh, to steer the discussion preparation more than I do for a class-based uh, seminar, using study questions and setting specific exercises that I want them to talk through so that everyone has a starting point, something that, yes, I can contribute this. Now, uh, I offered to talk a little bit specifically about uh, the language courses, uh, as I know many colleagues will uh, be taking language courses online, uh, and that's how we uh, complement each other as well, I think. Um, we've taught uh, online uh, language in this format that I'll refer to for several years now. Uh, and this is in reference to beginners and intermediate modules primarily. Um, I should say there's excellent resources on both teaching and assessing uh, language classes online in the CUCD blog that uh, Helen Lovett compiled recently as well. So uh, if you're looking for further ideas, please, please do have a look at that. It's, it's really fabulous material. I'm going to use some of it myself. Um, but I run my language modules uh, in a format of having pre-recorded lectures for introductions of new material where I essentially rephrase and give a little bit more uh, flesh on the bone uh, to the textbook introduction, give a little bit more uh, linguistic historical background and so on. I always finish there with next step suggestions, both for wider reading and uh, motivate why I've selected particular exercises for us to do. Uh, we run a live and recorded weekly webinar. And our assessment is entirely open book and entirely online. In terms of the feedback webinars, 
uh, that I run on their translation exercises. For those of you that use reading Latin, this is usually based on the reading exercises in the uh, grammar uh, part of the book. Usually it takes about 60 minutes. Uh, I've run them in evening times uh, for my normal distance learners, daytime uh, for my undergrads. What I do there in terms of steering the discussion is, uh, is to ask for a written submission prior to the webinar that I go and mark before I meet the students. Um, and that reassurance gets sent to them then before we meet and uh, helps uh, shape more confident contributions in the webinar. And it also allows me to be more active in calling on particular students, uh, even uh, in a situation where I can't see uh, their faces, where I can't see whether they're looking like, yeah, yeah, this is fine, I know how to do this, uh, or not. Um, I'll often ask, yes, so uh, you had a very neat translation of this line, can you go through it? You had a question on this, can you pick that up a bit? Um, and it also allows me to involve students who can't attend live sessions and draw them into the group. Um, and the more, I, the more explicit I am about doing that, the better response do I get. If I mention names, they feel more included. If I just mention uh, the abstract issue that they brought up, it's not quite the same effect. Um, I record these um, for those not uh, able to attend live. Um, and that also sets a pattern where, yes, it's okay not to be able to join every week. Uh, but I encourage pre and post webinar questions from non live participants on the discussion forum and then draw them into uh, next week's discussion or into uh, the one that they have already asked about. In terms of assessment, we moved to assessment online in a bit of a crisis situation too, where the quality assurance requirements were stepped up significantly within my institution and we couldn't quite do the non-invigilated time tests on an honesty basis that we had initially, quite rightly I think, but nonetheless we were doing it a little bit more quickly than we would have liked. Uh, we wanted to sidestep uh, cost invigilation, uh, we wanted uh, the system to be more flexible and we wanted to be able to mark more quickly. Still, we wanted to assess all the things that you look for in uh, a beginner's intermediate level uh, assessment. We wanted to quiz them on vocab, on grammar and syntax, on reading comprehension and translation. Um, and the way that uh, we solved this, and I really must uh, say thank you to Fiona Mitchell uh, at Birmingham, for being so game and uh, teaming up with me in developing this. Um, I did the Latin side, Fiona came in and did uh, the Greek side for us uh, a year later while she was still with us in Lumpeton. Um, what we did was to put students under time pressure so that even though they have access to all online tools, all their notes, the grammar books, dictionaries, etc., they don't have time to look up every word or construction. Yeah. So um, I would set 36 questions for a time test, for example, where in the paper version they might have had 10. They would get uh, about a minute per question. So it's, it's, it is quite uh, time pressure. Um, if you want to go for an online uh, exam for this language level, I would say start not with your original paper exam. I did, I had to scrap it in the end. But start rather with what types of question formats your particular VLE platform offers, whether it's true or false questions, multiple choice, match questions, drag and drop and so on. What I found over time, and you have a couple of examples of that here, is that I shifted away from uh, multiple short translation to focus more strongly on comprehension and the process that underlies translation. Of course, we have a translation included as well, but it sits at the end and um, it's slightly limited by the fact that uh, so many texts 
and solutions are available online. And uh, I've never been fond of the sort of make up Latin uh, or make up Greek uh, kind of texts. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the amount of questions needed, uh, 36 for a one hour test and 60 for a two hour exam. So they do need to move through them. Taka taka, of course, some will take longer, some will take uh, 10 seconds just to open the page and click yes. Um, but if you uh, want to do this securely uh, and have a decent level of randomization, you would need, uh, we decided, at least four questions behind the scenes for each one that the student sees. And that meant that for uh, the first Latin module, I wound up with more than 500 individual questions. If you're not going online, uh, due to uh, the COVID crisis, uh, that will sound like a lot of time, and it is time consuming. Um, when we did this, only the first test was ready at the start of term, mostly because I wanted to see how the students did, but also uh, because of workload considerations. Uh, the support from our then external, Amy Russell, thank you, Amy, uh, was absolutely essential in that process and I would uh, strongly urge colleagues to be helpful if anyone goes for this or has to go for this kind of thing uh, down the line uh, in the autumn. What that experience shows though is that this can be done under time pressure whether it is for formative or summative assessment. This might not be the time to go down this route for um, assessment for marks but it might be something that can help with uh, making uh, formative assignments uh, more varied. So um, I'm going to leave it there. That was a very quick whisk through. Uh, I hope I didn't take too long, April. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to take questions, uh, whether uh, today or via tweets or email or what have you. Thank you very much. Right, can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Sorry, it took a while to unmute then. Um, thank you, Magdalena, that was uh, amazing. And um, if, if we can have those slides maybe for some part of the website that members could uh, use, that would be fantastic. I'm gonna pass straight over to Ursula uh, to talk to us before we open for the chat. If we can unmute M Ursula. <laughs> oh, hang on, you're still on mute. Virginia's just doing it. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So what um what I'm going to say is going to be slightly different um because um when April asked me to do this um um my first instinct was um even though the OU is a very obvious place um to go for advice on this kind of stuff I think that it's also a very very different university in the way it's set up. Um, and we both thought it would be helpful for me to just spend five minutes running through how we operate so that um, that can sort of frame the kind of questions you might want to ask me. Now, I'm, I'm now, I'm now pa very painfully aware that there are lots of OU people um, at this meeting. I can see quite a few of them. Um, so um, please, um, uh, you know, people chip in if you think, um, if you think I've, I've missed something or misrepresented something. Um, but I'm just going to give you a quick rundown, if that's OK. Sorry, it's a bit of a change of, of, of sort of pace and subject from, from Magdalena's very, um, very useful, very detailed advice. So I'm going to just say a few things about how the OU operates and then a few words of advice from, from, from my end. Um, so to start with, um, there are sort of three, there are three things that, that make the OU quite unique. The first is are our student demographics. Um, our students don't have to do A-levels to study with us and only actually about a third of our students um, had A-levels when they registered. Um, three quarters of our students are employed in regular jobs while they're studying, so they're essentially part-time learners. Um, a third of our students are below, only, only a third of our students are below the age of 25. 
so we have, have, a, have an older demographic. 15% um, of our students have a registered disability, and I think it's a similar number who are prison learners. Um, we've got students registered um, with us who are located all around the world. Um, so all of this kind of um, together um, means that um, we, our student demographic is quite different from, from regular universities. Um, the second thing that makes us very different is um, that we're a distance learning university. So we're geared entirely to distance learning um, and distance learning is the infrastructure baseline um, for all the materials that we put together. The third thing that's different about us is that we're absolutely huge. Um, we have about 180,000 students um, and so we operate on a very different scale um, to most um, other universities and that, that has an effect on how we teach things um, and um, how everything's sort of set up. Some of our modules have thousands of students on them. Um, it's not unusual for classics modules to have 400, 500 students studying them. So there's a certain difference in scale. All of this is by way not to boast, but to provide a bit of context um, for how, how we operate um, in teaching terms. So our modules are basically like product packages that we put together and they're put together over several years by a whole team of people. And, and then they go live and then and when they go live, they, they tend to run for a whole um, academic year. Um, and then they are usually offered once a year um, for about 10 years um, and, and before they're, they're pulled off the system and replaced with a, with a new product. Um, each module is put together, like I said, usually over the space of two plus years by a whole um, team of academics. Um, those module materials um, can include um, textbook style teaching materials, videos, audios, online interactive activities. Um, they tend to be very multimedia in nature. Um, we have um, at the OU, we've got our own recording studios and camera teams and all the rest of it. Um, so um, a lot of our audio visual resources are, are made bespoke for those uh, module materials. Um, we also have a very close relationship with the BBC. Anyone who's seen the OU logo at the end of BBC documentaries will see um, just how close that relationship is. We provide a lot of great research for BBC programs and we have access to their um, AV archive to use with our, um, in our um, materials um, as, a, as a kind of quid pro quo. What we generally don't do in our teaching materials, um, or at least not anymore, and those of you who are thinking of late night BBC programmes in the 70s and 80s, um, is record or live telecast lectures as such. Um, the bulk of, this, of the actual learning materials are in textual form and can be read by students at their own pace and, and in their own time. Um, and the form this tends to take is um, sections of text, um, which takes students through a particular topic in the way that perhaps a lecture would at a regular university. But this is then interspersed with activities for the students, like going off and reading a journal article and answering questions on it, that kind of thing. Um, when we write our materials, we um, need to have our very diverse um, demographic in mind. So we have to ensure that it as is both at degree level and also written in such a way that people with very little background knowledge of the subject can get up to speed um, without being overwhelmed. So um, you can imagine that this is no mean feat and this is part of the reason why it takes so long to put um, our modules together because the module materials go through many different draft stages. These drafts are commented on, vetted and amended by a whole lot of people. Um, peer review amongst the academic team, the disability office, various editors and all, all the rest of it. So what comes out the other end is the result of literally thousands of hours of work. So it, this is, this is a, a very different um, setup um, to what most um, of you guys um, are, are looking at. Um, the other thing that's um, kind of strange about OU teaching is, um, is the tuition system. Um, because the modules are so large and because students are dispersed across a large um, geographical area, we have a kind of um, strange kind of um, division of labour system where central academics um, like myself, um, who are based in Milton Keynes, or at least theoretically, we work from home most of the time, um, are responsible for putting the materials together um, and also writing each year's new assessment materials for each module. 
um, and doing the exam boards and all that kind of stuff. But the actual direct contact, most of it with students is actually in the hands of our associate lecturers um, and um, some um, uh, former associate lecturers are in the, in the, in the audience today. Um, and um, and um, they are dotted around the country and they're assigned tutor tutorial groups um, for a particular module. Um, so they essentially teach the material that we prepare centrally, but they have obviously have a certain amount of freedom in, in how they put their tutorials together and how they do this. Um, we still have some face-to-face -face tutorials going on around the country, obviously not at the moment, but a lot of this is now done online, either synchronously um, using Adobe Connect or asynchronously through um, structured forums. Um, and the, the idea around this is obviously to give people a certain amount of choice and flexibility because obviously given our demographic there are um, lots of uh, different um, things, lots of different demands on people's time, work, caring responsibilities and possible disabilities. Um, so we have a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous and that's um, what Magdalena also just said and that's, I definitely underline that. Um, we have quite a few marked assignments on our modules. They can, modules can have anything up to sort of six marked assignments um, and our associate lecturers prepare the students for these assignments and mark them as well. Um, uh, we do have some physical exams in, in set geographical locations and uh, not this year. Um, and that, so that's, that's sort of to give you a bit of an idea of how we operate. Um, like I said, it's, 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 it's quite different to how most of you will be operating, but um, there are some things um, that um, I, some advice that I wanted to give you. A lot of that has been um, preempted by Magdalena, so it's 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 really good to to know that 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 sort of the the sort of um, tenets of wis wisdom around online teaching are, 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 are you know people are picking up on the same are picking up on the same things. Um, I would underline synchronous teaching online um, doing an online lecture or something like that um, yes bite-sized chunks but there's only so long that people can concentrate on um, on listening to something online um, an hour tops I would say um, and um, associate lecturers in um, in the audience might um, might have some advice on that as well but definitely bring in asynchronous um, because that gives um, people um, the flexibility to dip in and out of their of their studies and it means that they um you know they like magdalena said they might be under very very different circumstances now um so um part of a part of that is really to think about to, to put yourself in the position of your student you know try to think about where they are where are they doing this What's their like? Like Magdalena said, what's their internet collect, collect connection like? Where are they? You know, how are they likely to be doing this? Um, what are the constraints on their time? Um, and and sort of gear your teaching around that. Um, I guess one of the things that we do that I think probably works well is to build in a mixture of media, um, different things for them to to do and and look at read, watch, listen to. I think, I think um, variety um, is the spice of life when it comes to online learning um, in a way that it perhaps is um, easier to, to do things um, in face-to-face in, in -face teaching in universities in a, in a, in a more sort of, um, in, yeah, in a, less, in a less varied way and, and that's okay because you're in a physical space together and, and, and it's dynamic in itself. Um, now, uh, some of the other things that I was um, thinking of um, with forums, um, yes, it's, it's really important um, to, to set up forums. That's the best way to teach um, asynchronously, um, you know, to think about how to structure them, how to structure the threads um, on that forum. Um, they, they are going to be a very mixed group of, of people and some people you will find just like you will in a tutorial group you will find people who talk a lot sometimes too much um, and you'll, you'll find what we call lurkers um, people who, who don't really engage very much at all and you end up having to sort of manage that I think in the same way that you would in a classroom you have to sort of um, I think um, 
um, make sure that the people who are very forthcoming in communications find a way of sort of steering attention away from them um, to, an, to an extent if, if that's sort of um, um, intimidating others. Um, but also I think one of the things that I've learned and, and people like Tony and Emma might, might disagree is that they, you, there's also always going to be an element of people who are lurking and that doesn't mean that they're not learning if, if they're reading other people's questions and other people's um, um, contributions they, they they might still be getting something out of it so so that it's I think sometimes it's probably good to just accept that some people aren't going to be quite as um, active as others um, and, and the final thing I want to say I know time is pressing on um, is that I think something that I've learned through running forums um, on the MA, and I think so in the, and I saw in the chat box quite a few questions. I'm not looking at the chat box at the moment, so I don't know whether other people are asking questions. But um, is 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 um, forum engagement? How do you keep people engaged or get people engaged on the forum? And I think part of that is building up a bit of a momentum yourself. You know, building up a bit of enthusiasm and and um, and um, asking questions and responding to things, but also um, I think that there is a um, I think there is a um, there's something to be said. And actually, I've done a bit of work on this for for the MA, um, or a bit of pedagogical research on this. Set if you set up me uh, various means, whether it's on the forum or or a sort of a separate part of the forum through which students can talk to each other informally about things, not, not necessarily even about the, about the module, but just get into the habit of chatting to each other um, and popping up and, and saying things like, oh, it's two o'clock in the morning, I can't sleep, I might, I might start working on my essay, is everyone else okay? You know, all that kind of stuff. If you can get that kind of momentum going and that kind of group feeling and people get used to talking to each other, Th then that can have a positive effect on how much they interact on the actual teaching materials. Um, and that can sometimes mean pulling yourself back. Sometimes if you put too much on a forum, if you pop up too often, you answer questions and you comment on everything everyone says, they rely on you to talk and they think it's a conversation between them and you. Sometimes the more you pull yourself back after at a certain point when you've got a little bit of momentum, if you pull yourself back and they start talking to each other. Um, I, I've found sometimes the more I pull myself back, the more they talk to each other. And actually that helps a lot more to get the momentum going um, than, um, uh, than so anything you can do actually. Um, so um, and I mean, Helen, Helen knows all about this. I mean, we, we started doing this. Um, we, we, we set up um, a, a Facebook group for RMA um, students um, and, um, and they started chatting to each other on, on there about their, their gardens and their dogs and whatever. But that had a huge effect on the way they interacted in a, in a teaching environment. They got to know each other. They felt like a group. Now, I'm not saying set up Facebook um, groups, but that's an example of how um, something you would think is unrelated to your teaching can actually have a huge effect on the way they relate to each other and, and how they help each other and do peer-to-peer -peer stuff in a, in a formal teaching environment. Right, that's all I wanted to say. <clears throat> Thank you, Ursula. <laughs> Sorry, there's always a slight delay. It takes a while to, to unmute. Uh, thank you both for that. We have until about two o'clock um, for questions. The chat's been very lively, um, but a few things have popped up in one or two uh, areas that I just want to put to Magdalena and Ursula. So thanks for all the really helpful advice around the actual practicalities um, of, of getting students involved and how not to give them too much and when to stand back and, and so on. Uh, the idea about variety is really interesting because one thing that we have to remember is that we have a variety of, of different types of learners as well and not everyone will want to sit and watch you know in the same way as not everyone will learn best by taking an exam or writing an essay. Uh, 
one of the questions that came up was around disability access. So particularly in Magdalena's exams example, where you have one minute per question, I think somebody, sorry, I've lost who it was, but somebody asked, how do you make adjustments then for, for people with genuine uh, requirements yeah. around that? Yeah, and uh, as, as colleagues uh, might know, we do have a fairly large uh, proportion uh, of students with complex support needs in Lampeter because we are a small place uh, where that type of student can, can feel particularly uh, looked after. So that's absolutely come up for us. Um, and uh, we have um, gone generally uh, with the extra time allowance just as they would get in a normal paper exam. Uh, but I have also on occasion uh, rechecked the exam so that they've been able to take a break in the middle, um, which means essentially setting up two tests and, and loading the questions up differently. Uh, I've generally uh, just had a dialogue with the individual students. I've also had some uh, gone through the types of tests that we do with uh, student support staff. Uh, to see what kind of issues they thought this type of test would throw up. Yes, it is a problem for some of our students with anxiety issues. Um, that's absolutely true and that's something I'm, I'm trying to work on how to best address. Uh, one thing that I have been able to do since we've been running it for a few years now is to really help set the expectation that this is a test that no one comes out of feeling that, yes, I got everything right, yeah, far less so than, uh, than a paper exam. Um, that I know has helped on some occasions. Uh, but what we've also seen on, on, on the flip side of that uh, is that the freedom to be able to move the exam and sit the exam wherever you want, because even my own campus students are completely uninvigilated. Um, in this test means that some of my uh, students with uh, anxiety issues, for example, have been able to sit their exam in their most comfortable environment uh, rather than a sterile exam room. Uh, and that has been a help. So the flexibility works both ways, I'd say. Uh, but yes, there are, there are some issues. There are ways around them. Uh, but it takes talking to your students and, and finding out their, uh, their best solutions. I think one of the things that really bugs me at the moment is the fact that I cannot change fonts or background colours uh, on the quizzes uh, on Moodle. Uh, and that's something I'm taking forward with our tech support. Uh, and one, thank you. Uh, one of the other questions, sorry, I'm just weaseling through. We um, one question Kate asks, uh, Kate Cook, is that some students say they're less familiar or less comfortable with different types of formats. And I mean, maybe in the OU, the students are, uh, are familiar with the format that's used. But particularly at the moment, we're all being asked to do things that we're not familiar with. And we're often making the assumptions that students are digital natives and mm -hmm. understand how to use a forum and I've encountered this myself and had to resort to all kinds of different means of communicating with them because no one's understood how to use the particular thing that I'm being told to use um, and I'm just wondering how how you think that can best be built into for instance if we're starting again in, in the autumn with online teaching what do we do at the start of the term <laughs> how do we make sure that everyone's familiar with the things that we're we're not ourselves very familiar with. I've kind of ripped off Kate's question there and asked my own, but <laughs> it's kind of a... <laughs> oh. Ursula, do you want to start on this one? Ah, she's on mute. Uh, Virginia, could you... I, no, I, um, I, I actually don't have anything um, useful to say on this, um, to be honest. Um, so um, I, I think probably this is the kind of thing um, that tutors at the OU have a lot more um, experience in than, than, than I do from where I am. So um, Magdalena, um, 
um, if you've got something, you, yeah, and you will certainly have something useful to say. But um, um, someone like um, someone like Tony or Emma might might have some advice from the OU end as well. Uh, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat with with anyone. I think Magdalene is trying to speak, but she's muted. <laughs> Virginia's also somehow muted herself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and this is the kind of thing that happens. Yeah. We need to take that into account. You know, don't feel that if, if you have this kind of, but I'm muted, I'm unmuted, you know, cut yourself on slack. It's a learning experience for the students, just as we teach them how to do uh, an oral presentation or how to phrase a, a seminar uh, response in a, in, a, in a considerate manner. Um, I do. Uh, do some very basic this is how to open a discussion this is how to go into the chat on skype or zoom or what have you uh, as vidcasts just screenshotting them them through it um, so i'd say just be prepared for those questions are going to be there i've found that um my institution and as you know we, we're small and we don't have a big budget they have been actually surprisingly well good at, at putting training materials for the students out there as well um, so i think learning and teaching departments are providing quite a bit of, of this material as well but it's our job to make them feel make our students feel feel confident in in using them and actually com be comfortable uh, with these different types of mediums uh, i do have one uh, prompt from my uh, students that I was chatting to this morning telling them I'd be doing this uh, and especially for uh, situations where we're teaching in, in extraordinary circumstances and, and recording ourselves not in the studio at work but uh, in our living room um, home office and so on use your pets if you have them anything that makes you uh, seem a little bit more like you know a person hello <laughs> that helps uh, set the tone as well and allows them to, to uh, feel more comfortable asking uh, very practical questions often. I would also, can I just come in there? Is that okay, April? Yes, yeah. I'm there. Thanks. I would also say just have a very light touch session for maybe 10 minutes where no teaching is actually happening, where you're not talking about the course content or delivering new stuff, but you're simply talking through the tools that you're using so you can get everyone to work out how to put their hand up if they need to in a conversation and literally if you just say we're doing this for 10 minutes it's not a, a huge commitment you might need to run that a few times if people can't make the specific time but it's not and it's useful for you as a an educator as well to practice what works and what doesn't um, and also to see what how confident people are so you get a sense of what your students are happy doing and not doing in that environment as well um, so yeah, ease off the, the actual, you know, real academic content just when you first do something. Thanks, Amit. That's, yeah, that's really uh, important uh, advice, I think, that, you know, just to spend the first bit of time, you know, people need to play with the tech. Uh, I know yesterday some of us on the WCC steering committee had to play with Zoom to make sure we knew what we were doing. Um, it's, yeah, uh, it's good advice to, to carry that forward to our students. Uh, another question that's come up a couple of times and Catherine's just asked something specific about um, and I guess maybe Ursula you might have uh, more of this uh, in some ways but dealing with sensitive subjects and not being able to have that physical connection almost face-to-face -face connection with your students how do you gauge how they're responding and if they're okay and what the emotional uh, aspects of that are and of course, in many ways, what the backlash is. I mean, if you're dealing with an online, it may be different for those of us with smaller groups, but if you get people misbehaving because they feel like they're anonymous to some extent because they're online, <laughs> how do you deal with that in this kind of online classrooms? Again, in terms of face-to-face, -face, well, face-to-face, -face, direct teaching, um, people like Tony and Emma will have, have more experience of this than I do. In terms of putting together the teaching materials and deciding what to teach, um, I guess the answer from the OU end is that we, you know, editors tell us if, if they think it's absolutely no way we can teach this kind of stuff and we have to be very, very careful about what we teach. That said, we do teach some 
fairly some racy stuff. Um, and I think Tony's taught on the MA. I don't know if you taught the MA part two. I think you were only on part one, weren't you, Tony? Yeah. So we've got a lot of sexuality stuff in part two um, of the MA. Um, and um, I don't, I haven't had any, um, I haven't, I don't remember ever having any feedback that people uh, are, were especially um, upset by that. Um, and I can't remember any forums that got out of hand um, on that. I mean, I think you, in terms of, you know, you, you use the same kind of judgment that you do in a face-to-face -face, um, situation in terms of what it is that you decide you teach. I guess um, not having those reactions, not being able to gauge those reactions might inform the extent to which you are confident in, 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 in particular things that you teach and you might want to, um, you might feel better about, um, I don't know, um, adapting that given that you, that you won't be able to react. Um, necessarily um, as quickly to to um, yeah to any problems I don't know sorry that wasn't a very useful answer at all <laughs> it's really helpful to, um, I'm noticing along the side because uh, I'm also a, going to teach I do teach a class in gender and sexuality and other people are doing as well so it might be worth people sharing ideas informally around how to do that but one thing that has struck me is that in the classroom it's very immediate and some students you know have difficulty responding to things particularly if it's something that uh, is part of their own lives as well so yeah. uh, actually having some asynchronous element involving those topics allows students to dip in and be prepared and to be able to stand back from them if they need to so actually like anything preparing the students for exactly and you do that in an online environment anyway um. And, and, and giving them the, the, a, 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 an avenue to, to contact you privately if they, they want to or need you, yeah. yeah. All right. Can I just quickly say something on this, April? Um, in some ways, I think the open university experience on that s sort of thing isn't quite so useful uh, because of the demographic of students that we often have. Um, I mean, particularly when I was teaching in the uh, in the southeast, I did sort of characterise students. A lot of my students were people who were terribly nice, but you were fairly sure that there was a copy of the Daily Mail in their handbag somewhere. Um, and I, th I think, for from the Open University perspective, these sort of issues don't crop up because we don't get the sort of students who are likely to bring up those sort of issues. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, this varies tremendously from tutor group to tutor group and probably from region to region as well. Um, but there is, there is a bit of a drift towards the more conservative type of student within the OU. Um, within the OU uh, demographic that I don't think is there in a lot of other people's demographics. Do you agree with that, Ursula? Yeah, that's probably true to an extent, I'd say, yeah, yeah. I mean, this was similar uh, when I worked at Birkbeck, perhaps there was a similar kind of uh, demographic that I'm noticing is very different to the demographic I have now at MMU where you know, our class on gender and sexuality had 23, 24 students, and two of them claimed they were the only straight people in the class, um, or the only cis straight white men in the class, or whatever, uh, and then complained because they felt left out, and it was a very valuable lesson for them, I think. Um, but yeah, I, th I think like most of the things we've been discussing throughout the day, it's, it's a matter of judging your own students and your own institution. Uh, I'm just looking through um, uh, issues of trust coming up uh, just for the last minute uh, I'll ask this question because it's come up a couple of times about how students how well aware students are of what the materials they're putting for so students might be anxious about answering a question on a forum because they don't know where that comments going and where it will be used or if they speak uh, in a recorded session such as this one how will that be used? So I guess it's just a, a matter of 
how do you develop that trust and how do you let them know where their words and their work are going? Or is that an issue that's not really that important? It's really important and it's, it, it means, I mean, it, it, it is the, probably the main reason I'd say that, that, um, it, that there is always um, a certain amount of heavy lifting that has to go on before a forum starts to really gain momentum. Um, people, you know, it is just very different sort of saying something in a class that just disappears into the air than right typing something into, into, a, into a platform. Um, and um, it's, I think you just have to be aware of that and, and, and possibly have to look, put a little bit more work into getting things going. But like I said, what, it's something, it's about getting used to it. And when people um, start to talk and they start to talk to each other and to you, that, you know, a lot of them will just forget about that after a while. It's, it's, it's really, a, it's, it's really a, a, I think it's really more in the beginning um and i mean people are perfectly happy to post all sorts of ridiculous stuff on facebook and that's typing as well so you know it's it's about sort of it's about it becoming a habit really i don't know yeah magdalena's trying to speak <laughs> yeah oh, good good i'm unmuted yeah no I'd, I'd i'd say the same that you know you do need to get to know the group and yes that is sometimes heavy lifting uh, before forum or discussions uh, whatever you have them even if it's uh, a live uh, online session uh, take the time to know the students do email them before the module starts and so on now that's easy to do if you have a cohort like i do of maybe at the most 10 15 people uh, in in each module um, but that is the way to it develops very significantly over the course of a semester uh, and uh, i guess in this situation uh, if you do teach students that you already know from campus things will be a little bit easier because they will already know you as a person you will know them uh, to some extent um, so you can draw on that uh, as you would when you entered a new classroom with them and giving something of yourself also makes a difference yeah. there like just if you just sort of pop up and say some very formulaic things but if you sort of if you sort of give them a bit of an idea of who you are yeah. um some, something sort of quirky or something you know just just some, something that that sort of gives a little bit of you away that people people yeah. are more inspired to give a little bit of them away as well yeah and that's actually something that helps with uh, with workload uh, as well you get more positive response even to minor admin related annoyances if the students know you a little bit better uh, mm. when you work completely with with people online so you know if we go into that uh, later on in the year um, rather than finishing off stuff then that's worth bearing in mind um, you might not want to do a full video or a full uh, online thing with them but it is important to show you show them your face um, to build uh, up to a point where they see you as a person as well. Yeah, and there's a fine balance, I guess, between yeah. having an element of humanity and, of course, uh, being judged by it, especially for women uh, in in different ways. Yeah. Oh, I've just noticed the time. Um, we we should leave 10, 15 minutes for people to get a coffee before um, the business meeting starts at 